Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in Vienna today. I'm going to do a quick five-minute introduction before we bring out the other two speakers. Um, what I want to focus on, which is my day-to-day -day job, is how politics and tech and digital come together. As you've seen this week with Mark Zuckerberg here in both uh, Paris and Brussels, the idea of data, the use of data, and how that interacts with both political parties and uh, everyday people uh, is, is, is at the forefront. Um, and I'm not sure how many privacy geeks we have in the room, but we have the new European data protection rules coming in tomorrow, which has frankly spent a lot of my time working on recently. So before we get into the um, interactive discussion with the other two panelists, I wanted to focus on three things. What is the role of government and policymakers to help um, instigate the digital revolution? What can big, both big tech companies and startups do in relation to working with government and also with, with ourselves? And then thirdly, the interaction between the two, right? Because you know, as much as maybe people in Brussels and he, maybe here in, in Vienna, the, the policymakers might think there is an issue here, I think most people, including myself, don't really care. We just want to use the digital services that we have. And so for, for me, what is the role of government? How, do they, how will they help us move this digital revolution forward? How can, I know Johan from the European Commission is going to come out and talk about the digital single market. What is the role of that? How do we create a European-wide digital market so we can compete with the Chinas and the, uh, the US of this world? The second point is the role of tech, both big and small. We've seen recently with the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal that you know, it can have a serious effect both on the democratic process and how we you know, live our daily lives. I guess my question is, do people care? Are we seeing a change in how people interact with the likes of Facebook and also you know, you, your businesses, the startups that are here? How are you using that? Are you approaching both tech and the use of data in different ways because of that, because of potential uh, backlash from, from your users? And I guess the, the third question I had is, how do these two come together? I'll often, in my job, I spend a lot of time both talking to tech and the policymakers, but few of them, frankly, talk to each other. And so when it comes to moving forward to make sure that we have you know, best practice for both ourselves, for politicians, and for the tech industry, how does that work, and how do you bring both sides together? And I, I, frankly, that last point, I think, is, is key, both here at places like Pioneers, but also in our day-to-day -day, uh, activities. How do we get past that so it isn't just a question of Facebook is good, Facebook is bad. P politicians don't know what they're doing. Politicians do know what they're doing. Sometimes I think that binary discussion isn't helpful, because in the end, you can't have a good tech industry and you can't grow your business without being able to, say, sell stuff from here in Vienna to users in, I don't know, Helsinki, London, uh, or Beijing. And similarly, I, I think there is an inflection point we are seeing now in which the take it as is tech industry is no longer going to fly, both because politicians are taking an increased stance on this say maybe what they did with the banking industry, say, five, ten years ago, now they are now looking at tech as maybe the, the next one that needs to be regulated. Also, I think that as consumers, we are changing. We are, maybe I would say this because I, you know, in my personal life I'm changing, but people are taking a bigger interest in the use of data, how it's being, um, you know, the interaction they are having with companies big and small. And so that is the landscape that we are right now in, in 2018. I want to bring out two speakers. First, we're going to have Johan from the European Commission, who's going to go into more detail around uh, the digital single market and what the, the Commission is doing in general. So, Johan, I'm going to bring you to the stage. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. I didn't really hear what you were saying because was there good. was a lot of smoke. Um, I also made an effort in order to uh, uh, be notified. I, I'm the only person with a tie. So you know that I'm from the commission. Um, what I would like to talk is where is Europe when it comes to digital developments? Uh, everybody here, of course, uh, agrees that digital is the future. But when we look at uh, where is Europe's place globally, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe's largest competitors, I think we sometimes uh, misplace uh, our uh, position. 
So just a week ago, the European Commission launched or announced another set of uh, the uh, DESI index, which is the Digital Economy and Society Index. We measure five areas. We look at connectivity, take up of services, digitalization of businesses, but also uh, human capital, the uptake of skills, and, and look at the, how the governments, the public sector, uh, provides uh, digital uh, solutions. And what emerges is that Europe, which is the good news, Europe catches up the United States slowly but surely. But at the same time, the global competition is getting much, much, uh, uh, much, much more difficult. What we see is that uh, South Korea and, and Japan are moving very fast. The four most digitally developed European nations are now lagging behind South Korea. And at the same time, China is catching up uh, and has reached the level of the four least de digitally developed uh, European countries. So it's getting tougher and tighter in the top, which means that Europe needs to get its act together. And that is essentially what my job is, to make sure that Europe can build a digital single market, which would even and harmonize the different regulatory barriers. We have 28 member states, they have their own legislation, and being a startup, it's probably very difficult to understand how these regulations affect you. So instead of trying to grow in Europe, a lot of startups, what I've done is that they've taken all their things, their services, and their bright ideas, and they've moved to a single market, which is called the United States. That's bad for Europe, and I think we need to make sure that that in the future happens less and less, that these startups actually have a place to grow here. And another interesting development which I've seen from the Digital Society and Economy Index is that where, where we look at the different uh, areas that we measure, connectivity is becoming very, very important. The uptake and the demand for ultra-fast connectivity has grown tremendously. And there again, if we, if we continue to have uh, very, very different uh, regulatory frameworks of how to parcel out spectrum, uh, the bandwidth that is necessary for telecom companies to actually invest into connectivity, we will never have 5G uh, uptake or 5G investments at the same level than for example, South Korea or Japan. So we need, to, we need to unify our market. We need to make sure that Europe acts as a single market space. And I think that is my message today, because if Europe doesn't do that, then it is harder for the startups to stay in Europe. Great. Thank you very Thank much, Johan. Uh, the final speaker we're going to have on before we get into a good panel discussion is Tom from Canada 2020. So Tom, please come out. Do I stand right here? All right. Morning, everybody, or afternoon, everybody. Uh, where does the presentation go? There's one over there. There it is. All right, everybody. Uh, Let's go down there. Buttons. This is me, I'm Tom Pidfield. Uh, I'm the president of Canada 2020, which is a progressive think tank in Canada. Uh, and in a company called Data Sciences, which is a uh, data analytics firm. I was also chief digital strategist for the campaign, uh, 2015 federal election. I worked on uh, Macron's campaign. I've worked on a few other campaigns here up and, uh, and around uh, the world. Uh, basically, when I started the campaigner, uh, as my mic's not working so well, Tony, I was like you. Uh, Take the hand microphone. That's, yeah, that's not my voice. All right, here we go. So I wasn't a campaigner. I was like you guys. I ran startups. Uh, I had a co-location space in Montreal, and uh, we had uh, a seed fund. One of the uh, companies that we were successful with exited to Airbnb, and then uh, a friend of mine named Justin Trudeau uh, approached me and said, I want to run for... Prime Minister, you know computers, so I need you to run the digital campaign. 
And of course, I had never run a campaign in my life. Since then, uh, the stories have changed. So a lot of what we did was, uh, was celebrated uh, and it, to this day is very innovative. Uh, but we've been going through a sort of change cycle for the last six months. The elephant in the room is this story about Cambridge Analytica and another Canadian named Chris Wiley. Um, I think most of you know this story. Basically, uh, Chris and others, I guess Chris would say he didn't, but other people scraped data off of Facebook. That data was used to build psychological profiles on people uh, and then to serve and test advertising that was then claimed to have affected both Brexit and various campaigns, including the Trump campaign. Uh, so that's created a lot of hysteria. We've been working our way through that these last six months. Um, I think the first thing I wanted to do is sort of explain a bit about what actually happened. Uh, for those of you who don't know or understand how models are made, basically Cambridge, uh, it's a pseudoscience uh, psychographic modeling. Basically what Cambridge did, as I said already, is they scraped the data using an API that probably a lot of people in this room have already exposed before. It's no longer available as of 2014 this summer. Uh, it was turned off, but the data was already exposed. Uh, and then they take that data and they basically put you into a, um, into a spreadsheet and they weight it and they get a sense of the degree to which you are affected by your choices. Uh, and what typically happens is the weights are very, very small and have very, very little or no impact at all. But they take that information, they put it into a model, and then they test ads to see if you react the way they would predict. And if you do, they say it works. The thing is, it doesn't work, even though uh, even the, the person who created it said it doesn't work. Uh, there's all sorts of different reasons for why it doesn't work. Um, but the main one is that you just create too much information. You essentially micro-target down to the point where you can't possibly generate enough info to take advantage of the differences in your micro-target. Um, there's also an immense amount of money that's required to uh, actually advertise to people at this scale and to get the impact. And a lot of you who use Facebook as a tool understand the degree to which you have to have massive um, uh, buys to even get a little bump in recall. So we won the old-fashioned way, or the new old-fashioned way. I'm just going to tell you what we did. What we did is, for starters, we were real. And by the way, a lot of these things I think are familiar to you guys and how you operate your businesses. So you know, on the left, you have an ad that was produced at an exorbitant expense, $300,000, uh, with a massive buy, and it reached 600,000 people. In the middle was something we made. It was an animation, made fun of Justin's hair. Everybody got a kick out of it, and it did decidedly better. And the third one was free. We didn't do anything. We just captured him in an honest moment uh, with the people who were supporting him, and uh, it took off. In fact, our logo, our slogan, our URL became the, the uh, that we started with for the, for the website, became the, the slogan for the airplane. So it really was digitally driven, the entire campaign. We also listened, which is something I think you guys are familiar with. We collected information that was given to us through explicit consent, people who were trying to find out more about us, what we were doing, and we had a very automated and efficient way of, of uh, responding to them. And we learned a lot from what they were telling us. So they told us if we were getting negative, they told us if we were doing something wrong, and they told us what mattered to them. And this collectively drew, drew, uh, drove engagement to an all-time high, uh, especially amongst youth voters, just reminding people that what they were thinking about mattered to them and, and taking the time to listen about what they were thinking about. We were also extremely efficient, so that's how we use data. We didn't use it to try and convince you. In fact, trying to convince you of anything is really hard. We could sit here and we will for 15, 20 minutes arguing and we'll probably not convince each other of anything, but you're gonna do that with a three second Facebook ad. What you can do is motivate people. So if you've already decided you're gonna vote for me, I'm gonna make sure that you remember to vote. I'm gonna give you the resources you need to convince your friends or your mother, uh, and you're gonna help me uh, to get somebody elected. So like I said, we don't care what, we, what, what beer you drink. We don't care what, that doesn't motivate your voting intentions. What we care about is what's working best, are you a good door knocker, how do we reach you efficiently, and how we're gonna motivate you. And we use reports like this, and this was very innovative in the campaigns. So we have real-time reports. The one on the left tells us how well you are responding to our models. When we knock on the door and we think that you're supposed to be a liberal supporter, are you actually a liberal supporter? Do we have to correct for that? Uh, the one on the bottom left is your lifetime value, how much you're worth to us as a donor over time. Should we spend our money engaging with you 
or should we, um, should we move on to better donors? The one on the top right is how we're doing everywhere, all the time. Are we forecasting to win in a riding? Are we going to lose a riding? Situal awareness, very important. And the one on the bottom is the health of every riding or constituency that we were running. And having these reports and being able to push them into the team uh, was a critical component of our campaign and allowed for real-time decision-making. Collectively, all of this, uh, the research demonstrates, lifted our total turnout by 7%. So we won by increasing turnout, by engaging people, by bringing them out, not by suppressing them, not by trying to convince them that they didn't like something. We did it by finding the people who cared about stuff and getting them involved in the political system. And as a result, uh, we won 39 of 40 targeted ridings that we targeted in the last two weeks of the campaign. So it was very, very successful. And um, I added this one on the top because, again, I go back to my, my roots. We always talk about pivoting when I was involved in, in being able to pivot and be agile in politics is just as important as it is in a, in a business environment. We test everything, everything. So we would test ads, we would test tactics, we would test strategies. Um, the, this uh, organic ad at the top, this old mayor in, in Mississauga, Ontario, tested really well. We didn't even design it or expect anything. So we then pushed it and we spent millions of dollars on television ads. But before we spent a dollar on television, we already knew that it was going to have an impact on our voter base. We had a commercial where Justin Trudeau would walk out and say, Stephen Harper says, I'm not ready. I'll tell you what I'm not ready for. I'm not ready for. And so for those of you in digital marketing, you know in the first five seconds, he's already said, I'm not ready, like three times, or five times, three times. And obviously that, uh, that is not the kind of ad you want to run when you're trying to convince people that Justin Trudeau is ready. So we tracked what pe where people, what people searched after, uh, after they were exposed to the ad, and we saw that although they, we saw an increase on our own traffic to our websites, uh, there was a greater increase to our competitors' websites. And a lot of people wonder about digital canvassing, if you can do it online. And this is something interesting when we work in the corporate world. Now we're trying to convince more corporations to do more um, offline uh, engagement. Um, the fact is, uh, however, online IDs tend to be more, uh, way more uh, accurate. People don't tell you the truth at the door. So uh, being able to do it online when there's a bit of an uh, anonymity works a lot more effectively. I was asked to talk a little bit about future campaigns. I mean, I could talk about all sorts of technologies that people are working on, uh, uh, natural language recognition, uh, AI, email, um, e adaptive email, uh, all sorts of stuff. I don't think many of those things uh, are, are proving to make a big difference. I think what really makes a difference is tactics. I was sitting behind here, and when you guys watch this presentation, it looks like the whole thing mechanically opens. But really, there's two people on either side pushing a girder. And I think a lot of the times we overcomplicate ourselves in our business. And uh, sometimes simple solutions are really what you need. So simple solutions, uh, what we did is we created a war room for the debate, the debate being a very influential time. We had 100 people focused on digital, combing everything. We cut and clipped things within minutes of them being said, and we would get into uh, the chat groups. We would get online, we'd get into the platforms, and we would advertise uh, our leaders' uh, strengths. Uh, and that was... That was the view of the debate. It wasn't what the media decided the view of the debate should be. Also, we created open accountability amongst the campaigns. So if you want to create an organic movement uh, and a grassroots movement, you want to give power and you want to empower people. And reporting has a, a really effective uh, impact on reporting. And I think you can think of this in your business, too. Every time you create a report, people start to, do, to look at it every day. It does two things. It brings people together around that, that common KPI but it also uh, lets people have some, the agility to explore. And uh, this is something we've been working on, which we really like. It's becoming more and more expensive on Facebook and, and online tools to acquire people. So we're now focusing more on keeping people. So we track everything, uh, all our interactions at the door, uh, by phone, how many ads they watch, how many times they uh, open an email or they make a donation or take an action. And then when we see people are getting disinterested, we do interventions. We show up at the door, make a phone call. We send some, uh, somebody uh, to talk to their friend. Another thing is just putting it all together. So I won't go through this, but essentially, there are so many digital touch points, as most of you know, and understanding the journey that people go through on their way to making a decision of any type 
um, and how they ingest the, the, the information you're providing them is a really important part of the process. And there are tools and dashboards like this, which some of you probably have seen in similar marketing tools that allow you to track that process and that journey along the way and find out when you're really having an impact with voters. So I was also asked to talk about uh, GDPR, just as a segue, I think, to our conversation. I'll admit I don't know a lot about GDPR, um, although I do work for some European clients who are now scrambling to figure out what the impact's going to be. What I can tell you is there are three fundamentally different philosophies. In the US, probably in large part because of their obsession with uh, property, uh, the data belongs to the organization. Uh, in Canada, maybe also a bit of our tradition, we don't worry as much about who the data belongs to, but we, we worry about a principle of accountability. So whoever has the data, data in itself isn't negative, it's not bad, it's just data, but what you do with it is bad, uh, or could be bad, and you need to be accountable for the decisions you make. And then uh, recently, in my view on GDPR, is it's really gone heavy towards the individual being the focus, and that you own your data, uh, and, uh, and that you get to decide what you do with it. Of course, this creates a few debatable uh, issues. Um, I think some things are sacred, explicit consent. Uh, you gotta have explicit consent. People won't share real data with you, and if you don't have real data, you can't make real decisions. Access uh, and rectification, obviously, if something's wrong, it's wrong. And again, why would you want wrong data? Uh, data mobility, people gotta be able to vote with their feet, decide where they wanna take their data, if you abuse it or if you don't use it properly. Mobility is the best way to, uh, to fix uh, abuse of data, data abuses. But I do think we have to watch out about over-legislation. I'm not saying, again, I'm not an expert on GDPR. It is, it is a very expansive piece of legislation. We had something similar. We have Papita and Castle in Canada. It covers a lot of the same ground. Castle is a good example of where legislators get it wrong. They're slow, they don't catch up with the speed that we're all working at, and sometimes there's a real consequence to that. Castle was an anti-spam legislation, and basically it took like a year, a year to, uh, well, maybe two years for them to get out, and then um, as soon as they did, by the time it was, it was tabled, uh, Microsoft and Google had figured out spam on their own. The problem was, uh, it was very restrictive to charities, uh, and not-for-profits, and they don't have a lot of money, and the way they get their money is by seeing if people are interested in what they're selling. Uh, and this is good stuff they're selling. So uh, we basically decimated the charitable fundraising industry in Canada, and I don't think that's a good thing. I think we could have figured out a way to do it more, with more sensitivity. Uh, I think there are some risks in GDP, GDPR, from my understanding. There are sensitivity classes. Some information is more sensitive than others. Uh, there's, pro there's prohibitive heavy stuff that small companies will have difficulty trying to do. Uh, and of course, there's always the issue of future-proofing. Like, can an AI algorithm be susceptible to GDPR or could fall under GDPR, or what to, to what extent? I think the primary thing to remember, and I borrow this from, from Google, and I think there's some irony <laughs> behind this from Google, but don't be evil is, is sort of key. And I think remember that data has changed the world uh, digital tools have changed the world in amazing ways. And I think we forget that sometimes when we're fear-mongering about psychographic profiles and little robots controlling us through our ears. Digital uh, helps like-minded people connect and get together. It makes campaigns affordable. It improves engagement, increases voter turnout, uh, and improves accountability and authenticity. Me Too and all these movements are, are critical. But there are risks. I think there are things like... Um, uh, bots uh, and psychographic modeling that as they progress can have more damage. Not as they are now, but as they evolve. And certainly the echo chambers, fake news, malicious hackers, those are real things. Those have real impacts in how they're implemented. So I just wanted to give you a few quick examples. I see I'm out of time, but I wanted to give you a few examples of how data is changing the world um, in a positive way. We at Data Sciences are involved with a group called CHI, this is a charitable analytics institute. And basically, all we do is take all the techniques we use to help political parties and companies uh, make more money to help charitable organizations achieve their goals. You need a good example would be how you fight genetic disorders with the genome. If you don't have data and you can't see the difference between people who are affected and not, you cannot solve genetic problems. Or uh, eradicating infant malnutrition. We're working with the World Food Program on trying to digitize 
these books that have never been used that, that are all throughout uh, Africa. And what we're finding is not only is it telling us how they are uh, pushing out uh, their, um, their resources, but they're also uh, doing family, re we're finding that you can use the data to do family reunification, manage and, and monitor infectious, infectious, infectious diseases and migration patterns. And then of course, hate speech online, it's another example of something that requires data to train and learn. And that's it.